Welcome everybody to our panel on state and local policy solutions. Uh, I'm very excited to be moderating this panel. Uh, I think um, as, as uh, Congresswoman Pingree talked about this morning, um, we currently have a Congress where it's a little hard to get things done. So I think um, maybe now more than ever, there's such um, great opportunity and excitement at the state and local level to pass really innovative um, food recovery policies that um, can be models for um, national and federal change and also models for other cities and states around the country. So um, I am uh, excited to be talking about this. I am so thrilled to have our amazing panel of experts. Uh, my name is Ona Balkas and I'm, a, I'm an attorney here at the Food Law and Policy Clinic. Uh, I'm actually um, moving on to work for uh, city government uh, in my next position, as you all heard this morning. So uh, also excited um, to be making that switch. So. Uh, I am going to um, turn it over to our panelists, and we're starting with Ashley Zanoli, who, um, I don't have your bio. <laughs> I can give you my bio, hopefully I can speak to that. Um, so I am actually an employee of the US EPA. I worked in our Region 10 Seattle office for the last nine years. Um, and I just transitioned to a temporary assignment with the state of Oregon in their Department of Environmental Quality. So a lot of the work I've been doing around preventing wasted foods being transi transitioned there with some work I will share with you today. Great. And then Ana Carvalho from the city of San Diego. Ana. I work for the city of San Diego. I oversee the food diversion program for the city. And Lorenzo Macaluso from Recycling Works in Center for Ecotechnology. Yes. Work for Center for Ecotechnology. We're a nonprofit environmental organization based here in Massachusetts. And we run the Recycling Works in Massachusetts program. Thank you. So we'll start with Ashley. Okay. So there's not a microphone up here, so I'll sit here. Hopefully, you can see there's all the slides. Hand one if you want. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this talk's going to be a little more provocative than a lot of the talks that I've heard today, but it's going to be a great opportunity for us to really <laughs> dig deep and figure out you know, the best way to talk about things, because language tends to drive culture, and as you heard from Doug Rao this morning, how we talk about things really matters. So my talk here today is about why framing matters and how we can really think wasted food in the US. The idea of framing is that choices depend in a large part about the way in which problems are stated. So to date, the issue of wasted food has been portrayed as a landfill problem. We talk about methane emissions, and we really view it through a solid waste lens, which is appropriate because most of the agencies working for it the, on this issue are our solid waste agencies. And what I want to share with you today is Oregon's materials management story, and hopefully inspire us all and maybe think a little more holistically and systemically about the why before the how and the what. Um, asking questions about strategies to address wasted food versus food waste often lead to really different conversations, which maybe some of you have had in this room. And I just want to own it up front that I'm guilty of this framing as well. In all my presentations from 2010 till about 2014, I led with that big bold fact that food waste is the single largest and least recovered waste stream in the US. But the more I learn, the more I realize that this limited framing is driving really limited solutions. And I think we're at a time where this movement's really coalescing. We're gathering great momentum and investment from governments, even VCs from Silicon Valley, uh, social entrepreneurs, and, and NGOs. So as we think about how to make more meaningful progress, it's going to require really all of us to listen first to understand versus listen to respond and justify. Um, maybe think about how we can collectively work together when credit doesn't matter. Um, and, and really, I guess, hit that home on that, that why before the how and the what and understand that in a deeper way, which is what I hope to share with you today. So I plan to cover three topics in my, in my conversation today. One is why framing matters in solving any great systemic issue. Two is why a materials mindset matters and how it differs from a solid waste mindset. And then three is to take you on Oregon's materials management journey, which has really been unprecedented. 
And we're working on a team with other professionals that have been brought in to really blaze a new trail for others to either follow or collaborate along the way. So Doug beat me to the punch with this analogy that I thought was so clever. Um, but why does framing matter? And here's why. So let's put it in action and try a little experiment. So if I ask you to think about your top three strategies to reduce food waste, what do you think about? Um, source reduction, donation, compost. So the hierarchy. Yeah. But a lot of times I hear, uh, well, I can compost it. I can recover nutrients through an AD. Like it's food waste. I can't really donate it. Well, when you flip the question and you think about what are the top ways I can reduce wasted food or waste less food, you often come up with different solutions. It's how do I reinvent that leftover meal? Or how do I ask my grocer whether they've set up a donation program? So it's just a, a quick example that I've worked with a lot of local governments to kind of visit that anecdotal evidence, that conversation shift depending on how you ask the question. And I would posit that Right now, with the solid waste framing, we really have a single hammer, which is disposal reduction. And when all you have is a hammer, all you see are nails. And the main conversation has been really framed around diversion. And while it's a noble goal, we need more and better solid waste management, it's really not the only solution when we're dealing with such a systemic issue as wasted food in the US. So here's an example, an actual example. I took out the company, so the innocent will remain. <laughs> um, I, they will be identified, but this is an actual example of untouched outreach that I received at a statewide recycling conference from a national organization. So what's wrong with this picture, with this food waste sign? <laughs> so is this, I mean, think about framing, is this really the message we want to be sending? I mean, I know that branding folks don't want gross pictures of food waste, but can we at least get a half-eaten sandwich? I mean, this looks like my grocery bag and not my compost bin. So it's a really nice way to highlight why mindset matters. So a materials, mindset, a materials management mindset really acknowledges the life cycle impacts across this full hierarchy. Um, I want to acknowledge fully that my career is built upon the shoulders of giants in the solid waste industry. And at the same time, while we now know better, I think we can do better. And the solid waste framing is limiting focus on that end of life management and optimizing that section and making an afterthought of thinking about full impacts across that life cycle. Um, EPA did an analysis in 2008 and found that 42% of all domestic greenhouse gas emissions come from the life cycle provision of products and goods. Well, Oregon DEQ did some back of the envelope calculations and found that if we recycled and composted everything that was produced or imported for consumption, we would only get at 6% of those 42% of uh, domestic emissions. So, while we can't control what the world will look like in 50 years, I really think our decisions and investments over the next few years will shape that to a large degree. Um, so I hope moving forward, we can really think about what kind of momentum we want to create, because once you create momentum, you have to maintain it. Um, and the materials management mindset allows you to kind of engage with the space in a much different way. And here's where the proof is in the pudding and why I think the solid waste framing is something we can all learn from. This is an infographic from the City of Portland and their Climate Action Now program, where they have a whole host of sustainable consumption actions. And the point here is not that no one should eat beef, it's just one example of one food category. But the point is that production impacts far outweigh anything related to transportation or disposal. And I was so, my mind was so blown when I saw this graphic, I asked the developer in their climate policy program to send me the background data. And you can't even see the disposal line, but it's actually there. It represents 0.05% of the overall life cycle impact of a pound of beef, and that includes methane emissions from landfills, and the transportation impacts are 1% of that overall impact. And I'm sure you've seen this graphic before, but um, you know the real point is, is that the waste we see is just the tip of the iceberg. I've been thinking a lot about the light spectrum and the electromagnetic, the electromagnetic spectrum. I'm a recovering engineer. Um, but you know, when those discoveries started happening in the 1800s, it exploded the potential for scientific innovation and discovery. We wouldn't live in the world we live in today if we were only responding to what we can see. And the point I want to make is that, in a large part, we're dealing with wasted food based on what we can see. So what we're doing in Oregon right now is to really shift from the solid waste to materials management perspective in more than talking points and good intentions. We're doing it through new policies, new work. 
and new priorities that fully address the life cycle of impacts. And we're working in new ways to identify what's currently invisible. We have so much of a conversation around what and how, but we truly don't understand the why. And until we can make those invisible impacts more visible, um, you know, our, our, our approaches to date will be rather limited. Um, and on average, the true cost of waste is about eight to 10 times the cost of disposal. And there are other studies that link the impact of waste prevention to waste disposal as 10 to 30 times higher through prevention. And these are all reasons why Oregon DEQ developed their 2050 vision. So this is similar to the light spectrum analogy. And what DEQ is trying to do is expand from that solid waste frame, that portion of visible light, and really bring to life what's currently invisible by a better understanding the loss reasons throughout the supply chain. Um, and those reasons include not just behavioral reasons, but also structural barriers that we may be able to overcome. And know that you're not alone. The Oregon DEQ just started out on this journey, but it, it came through some really fundamental legislation that passed last summer. Um, so through this legislation, Senate Bill 263 passed, and that authorized a fundamental transition from a solid waste to a materials management program. It updated waste prevention and recycling goals. Um, it allowed for new recovery goals as well. So we're not just working on prevention in a vacuum, but we're trying to make it uh, complementary to recovery or recycling goals. So that goal is to recover or recycle 25% of food that's being wasted by 2025. And that's not just a curbside collection goal. That's based on what actually makes its market. Um, moreover, we're strengthening waste generation goals. So those goals are to reduce generation by 15% below 2012 level, levels by 2025, and then reduce it by 40%, waste generation by 40% below 2012 levels by 2050. And note, it's not a per capita goal. I know people care about per capita goals, but um, does, does the environment. And here's what we're up to. So the formatting got a little messed up because it was uh, on a longer slide, but hopefully you can still read it. And this is all about DEQ strategy to prevent wasted food. So when the legislature passed uh, Bill 263 last summer, it also authorized this fundamental transition. And it's being followed up with leadership and a lot of creative and critical thinking that'll continue to happen at and with stakeholders across the supply chain. And it's worth noting that DEQ's 2050 vision wasn't developed for Oregonians, it was developed with Oregonians. And that's how we see this strategy continuing to play out. So um, we welcome anyone who wants to participate and those three goals are really around three main elements. So it's developing capacity in Oregon and elsewhere. It's also about increasing action around preventing wasted food at the business and consumer level, aligned with that vision. So that 2050, all Oregonians are producing and using material, materials responsibly while living well, conserving resources, and protecting the environment. And then really connecting those generation goals with actual environmental outcomes. You know, from the infographic from City of Portland, you may be able to really see how some of our goals may not be necessarily aligned with some of the drivers we care most about, like greenhouse gas emission reductions and water conservation. We went through, um, we came up with a list of about 76 different actions. And good news is it's not like Survivor. So as we go through and figure out where can the state play the most unique value-added role, where can we develop public-private partnerships to turn this vision into a reality, um, we plan to take all the actions that don't make the list and make them available to anyone who's interested, starting now if you'd like. Um, we also developed a really novel list of decision-making criteria that could really be used to guide any systemic challenge, not just around wasted food. Um, some of the actions, just to summarize, focus on policy development. We really want to track the voluntary date labeling standard that GMA is developing. Um, messaging, this really gets back to framing, and it's not messaging to other wonks like me, it's messaging in ways that resonate with people. Um, we had an interesting scenario with developing the vision. David Alloway, who I work with at Oregon, was engaging with one of the tribal leaders in the state. And he was so excited about the vision because he said it's the first time that people in the state are becoming civilized. Because in tribal culture, food's sacred, and we're finally starting to treat it as such. Um, it's about measurement. So we're developing the first ever statewide baseline study. Um, to date, we're having really limited framing because there are data sets in a large part. They're really confusing. And most of the frames show what's being wasted, but not why, or how much of it could have been eaten, or how much of it could have been donated. Um, we're also doing commercial and consumer campaigns statewide. So through the strategy and through that 263 rulemaking from the Senate bill, um, state, our local governments can comply with the rule 
by developing and implementing state um, these consumer and commercial campaigns, which uh, people like me will help be develop at the state. It'll build off of EPA's Food to Good and Waste Toolkit, as well as um, the Ad Council campaign, hopefully most of you are aware of. Um, K through 12 education, that's another piece. How do we build capacity in our future? And then research, including some really novel research about what is the most enviro environmentally and socially beneficial way to develop and implement a donation program. Um, so in closing, <laughs> I just hope you all appreciate why framing matters, and I've helped to open up a space of how we can start to view the world and this issue in a new way. Um, Oregon's materials management journey and vision is anything that anyone can shamelessly steal. There are lots of ways to address this issue, and I'm not saying this is the only one or the right way, but what I am saying is that new framing and actually looking at the full life cycle of impacts can open up new opportunities in ways that have yet to be explored. Um, I also want to just leave you with two points from Paul Hawken. I saw one of his talks recently, and at the end of it, he went through his whole drawdown project. And at the end of it, someone asked him, well, what are the top two things I can do to address climate change? And I swear I didn't talk to him. His top two were, one, look at the food you're wasting, even if you're composting it, and two, think about what you eat, because it has a huge impact. Um, so I look forward to working with all of you as we tackle this giant issue systemically, and I think it's worth noting that while we can go fast alone, we can go a lot farther together. So thanks for your time. So as we're transitioning to the next speaker, people who are sitting on the stairs, there are some empty seats that you can more comfortably sit on. It's up to you. Like chair, she like the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're doing the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll do, we're gonna save questions at the end. So while we wait, um, I'm Anna with the city of San Diego, and I do have an accent, mm -hmm. and I have only 12 minutes to talk about a lot of things. I travel a whole day, so I will talk about everything, and <laughs> it will go fast. And as fast as I go, the worse get the accent gets. <laughs> Shake it up. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, let me see, who is federal government here? Okay, state? Local? Nonprofit? For profit? <laughs> Attorneys? Oh, it's a different class. <laughs> Anybody else? Schools? Schools? Okay. Researchers? Okay. Anybody else? Just curious? Okay. Okay, so let's try this. This is what I'm trying to cover today, right? With an accent. So let's go. The current situation in California. Um, we have... Uh, uh, Assembly Bill 32, it's a global warming solution. We have to decrease greenhouse gas emissions by the level that we had in the 80s. And we are doing really well with that. But you can't disassociate greenhouse gases and climate change from waste, and especially from organic waste. So when you look at this, the California Air Resource Board had a study that shows that if you donate food, you save about 2.08 metric tons of carbon emissions, as opposed if you compost it, is only 0 0.42. So by looking at it as a resource manager, looking at it as a climate change situation, it's better to donate than compost. Nevertheless, if you don't have compost, you don't have soil to grow your food, you don't save water, you don't have organic matter, so you still need to compost. But it's interesting for our cause that we divert food waste, we help better with climate change issues. The other regulations that we have in California, AB 1826 just passed this year, they mandate organic diversion. So not just food waste, yard waste, clean wood, and food waste for all commercial facilities. And multifamily is just yard waste. The problem with that is we don't have infrastructure. There is not enough composting facilities nor anaerobic digestive facilities in California to absorb that, which is a crazy schizophrenic government action, but it works because put the pressure. Without the pressure, we don't move. So now private sectors and local jurisdictions are all trying to find solutions. So that's a good thing. 
Now in San Diego, we did a waste characterization study um, in uh, 2012, 2013, and this is what happened. Food is 15% of everything that's still buried in the landfill in San Diego, and we are 67% waste diverse. So it's about 190,000 tons, and they come from those sectors. We're going to focus on commercial and military. San Diego has a big military presence, as some of you might know. So all of this is being thrown away. Meanwhile, according to Feeding America, we are the seventh county in the whole nation with a higher population of food insecure people. <coughs> and remember that we are a military town, great weather. A lot of our veterans come back to San Diego, and a lot of them have a hard time catching up with life. So that's one of the reasons we are uh, a high population of food insecure. Now, the city of San Diego has a climate action plan, and I believe a lot of the cities are doing that. If they're not, they should wake up and start doing it. <laughs> and we need to look at that. And one of our plans is to decrease greenhouse gas emissions. So by 15% by 2020, and we're going to get 50% by 2035. We're not going to achieve that if we keep bearing organic in the landfill. And that's paper, cardboard, yard waste, food waste. Especially when you look at the greenhouse gas emissions impact that we can have with food being donated. It makes sense to look at donation as a waste reduction, as a management of a natural resource. And at the same time, we have a zero waste plan that we're going to achieve zero waste by 2040. We have plenty of time for the community to adapt to that. We're not going to achieve zero waste if we don't look at our organic and divert organic. So it is a waste reduction situation, but it's also a natural resource management because you're talking about water, you talk about soil, you talk about energy and greenhouse gases there. So here is a, the EPA, the federal people here. Take a look at that. My suggestion is that you eliminate the tip of the pyramid. <laughs> Incineration of any kind it makes sense because you're burning natural resources just uh but <laughs> landfill too right now we don't have to landfill here you have a ban it's coming everywhere so maybe epa should look at this and cut the tip <laughs> here's our program in the city of san diego i manage the the commercial food waste program in the city of san diego and my goal is to get that food out of the landfill. So I do everything that I can. I follow the hierarchy, and I try to teach people about source reduction, feeding people, feed animals, feed soil. And I've been doing this for 10 years, and for about eight years, I talk to wolves. <laughs> I talk, and they look at me like, oh, the tree hugger, and walk away. Or, oh, she is a goblin, I have to listen to her, uh-huh, uh-huh, and go away. Now they're paying attention, so it's a good momentum. This is what I look at the city of San Diego for commercial diversion just from business and military. We look about 80,000 tons. Limpact has a study that between 4 and 10% of the food we throw away before anybody eats. So I was conservative and I put 5%. If we can divert 5%, just 5% by source reduction, and if we can get 15% of that food to donate. And that's based on a study that I did with the loads that come to us, and also with Dana, uh, the report from Dana Gunters that says about 15% could be donated. So right there, you take 20% away that doesn't have to be disposed. And what does happen is, with that's 12,000 tons, that will generate to us about 20 million meals a year, reducing 5,000 tons 25,000 tons of metric emissions of carbon dioxide, reducing the need to process and transport that food with those big trucks, that's a good thing for us, and it's cost effective for the business. If you donate, you don't pay. If you compost, you pay less, in, at least in our region. Then, refed came. And I was looking like, okay, I'm doing this with EPA, and then I start looking at refed, I'm like, okay, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, some of those, not my problem, da 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 da, I went on, or not my capacity. But I was happy that I got a lot of stars for the program that we were doing. <laughs> and one of them, Consumer Education Campaign. I don't know if you all are aware about the Save the Food Campaign that was launched by the fantastic, right? So even, uh, we were having dinner the other day here, and we got some food waste. 
and we decided to carry on and give it to some homeless on the way to the hotel, and we didn't find a homeless, but we ended up with food waste, and I'm like, oh my God, we're on the hotel, they might have cameras to see who is a immigrant or not. No, you can't avoid the food waste, but when you look at the, say the food campaign, at the end of it, with the strawberry moldy inside your kitchen, I had that the other day. I cleaned the mold from a grape and I ate. <laughs> <laughs> but it's working for me. So a campaign needs to work for different segments of the population, right? This worked for me. Pay attention because campaigns die and we need to keep the momentum. This is a campaign that we had in the States during the war. And it's so powerful. Food is a weapon, right? I work with the military, I do waste diversion for them. They have the posters in the cafeteria. They don't read it, <laughs> they waste. So, but this is really important for us. It's a weapon, you have hungry people, you have malnutrition, you don't have people that's well educated. So when I go to the militaries and I work with them, I can talk about them, a grape that's gonna mold in the fridge, they're gonna look at me like, yes lady. Yes, ma'am, I actually say ma'am. But the thing is that when I talked to them about this, I said, your role as a military is to protect our natural resource. That is how we keep our nation strong. So our water, our food, our petroleum. So I connect with them and then they pay attention to that. So each campaign has to be different for different groups of people and we keep, have to keep them going. We can't let them die. Food is a weapon, don't waste, it's fantastic, and we let it die. So, another education on reach campaigns can be done in smaller uh, segments too. So, I get everybody from our community together, and I talk to everybody, and I bring them in, and I discuss situations, and we also have in San Diego the Food System Alliance that's doing that too, but they're doing with people like us, their interests. I go and I talk to the enemies. And I try to convert them, and it works. So sometimes, sometimes not, but I, I don't go away. So, another important thing about consumer education is training. We devote a lot of time in our education outreach, and we have done for a long time. Some programs last between a month to two years to implement. They see me for two years. <laughs> they want to get rid of me, but they can't. So every a, a year, and a, a month and a half until we implement the program. But the most important part of it is we talk to all levels. So you have the CEO and the janitorial. Everybody has to be involved and understand. We have a mandatory training for everybody that works in the kitchen and the janitorial, all the supervisors. And the training takes an hour. And it's not a training what we see a lot of people doing here. Here's the green bucket, put the food here, buy, no. The training involves talking to them about natural resource, about why we're doing this, how much are we saving, how many people are hungry, why we should donate, why we should compost, how compost is important for them to keep the job because it grow the food that they sell. So we connected with them. And I hate when I go talk to administrators and they say, oh, food, you know, kitchen people, you know, they don't get it. And I'm like, oh, yes, they do. <laughs> they are the ones that are throwing away the food. And then they look at me like, okay. So it's how you talk to people. Another thing that we do, we bring them to the greenery to see the food waste and we explain how we compose and we let them see the food waste. I have had people coming with masks and things like that and it really doesn't smell. but. That's another way to train them. Now, the difficult thing is how people see things. How many people see a bird there? Please, show of hands. Show of hands. Anybody see anything else? The same thing happened with people that generate food waste. That's a woman. What? Huh? <laughs> like this? Ta -da. Um, Got it? I know. So, it's important to understand that we see it, but they don't. So before I get angry, I go back to this. I'm like, all right, I already saw the woman. They still see the bird. How can I change that? Got it? The R, can I move on? So, you can see it? So the eyes on her uh, forehead, the head's her hand, okay. the tail is her leg. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so here's what I see at our composting facility every
every day. And that's the case of is it or it's not. <laughs> right? So some of them are food for soil, some of them could be feeding people or animals, and some of them just feeding animals. The difficulty is to educate the generator to see that. And I make them come and see the loads with me. So when they see the loads, I talk to them about that. I did a study in San Diego about some hotels that donate and don't donate, and I, how much they generate of food waste. It's a half what if those that donate. And so I showed them how much they would save just in tipping fees. So you talk to the brain, to the heart, and the pocket. I talk to the pocket on this one. It's working with some of them. Source production, we have a great example in San Diego with Impact. They work with a, a big hotel there. And at the end of it, they were able to save 13 tons of food a year that they were buying unnecessarily. Costing for nothing, throwing away natural resource, paying to dispose, crazy. So I use this a lot to help educate. Another one, the trailers. We have a small university that took the tray away from those hungry young college guys and decreased 22% of the food waste that they send it to us to compost. I know we fed sets about 30%. We only saw 22, but I'll take it. Now, REFAT talk about liquefiers, and I want to caution people about that. Liquefiers, in my opinion, should be considered. You get food that takes so much to grow, and you don't see that as a resource. You just pour it in the sink. Bye-bye. Well, no way. It's the way. You don't think about it. You don't think of that as a natural resource or a value to it. <coughs> and in San Diego, I talked to the uh, sewer treatment plant, and they said, we don't want it. We have a statement from them saying, don't do that. Because some of them use enzymes to dissolve that food, and as it dissolves and go in the pipe, they kind of compound together again, and they clog the pipe. Some of them use bacteria. That won't reform again, but still, you lose that material. Also, the liquid has a lot of organic matter, a lot of grease and food um, oils, and that picture that you see there is inside a pipe with grease and oil from those things. <coughs> so it's going to cost a lot more money to clean that from the sewer plant or from the generator. Another problem is that it has a bacteria that indicates potential health problems. And in San Diego, we are doing the purified water, which used to call toilet tap and didn't go well, so we changed it, purified water. That was going to cost a lot more money for them to treat that water for us to drink if the organic material go that high. And we already capture all the methane that we can. So the story about you're going to capture more methane, it's good. It depends on the sewer plant. And most of it's like you're just having a trash bag. Put everything here, and I store it in the back. The public's not thinking about what they're using or generating. So they're missing the opportunity of education. So I would love to see that being eliminated. Um, other strategies that we're doing. So as a government employee, I have my limitations. Some of them because I'm tied with political issues. Some of them because I am a bureaucrat. So I, I, I need to work with communities. And we have the community ingenuity, local business, and stakeholders. We tap on them. And I go after them. And I put some of them together. Some of them, I just join them. So my role is just building a team, getting everybody together, understanding where we are in it and how we can do. And so for that, my official title, I, I get all those business together. And I like to think that my official title in San Diego is the Food Waste Diversion Gospel. I just go and tell one about the other. I create envy. That hotel is doing your hotel is not. <laughs> and then they get it. I, I kind of put things together like that. And I'm doing this here, too. I'm sharing with you things that work there. So I am the official gospel, and I'm OK with that. Uh, urban agricultural, agricultural incentive zone, we just passed in San Diego. If you have a vacant lot, you can lease for five years for community garden, and then um, we can get tax benefits for you. And the interesting thing is that we have about 4,000 of them and most of them in the low-income communities. And those are the ones that don't have access to fresh food. So if you turn that in the community garden, you're going to build a community. You're going to get fresh food, healthy food, teach them how to work, and work with soil. 
the we fed talk about imperfect produce and okay? Okay. Okay, so <laughs> we have some done in San Diego Qualcomm. Now they are 15% uh, of the produce is with that and it's cheaper. So we're working on that. I did a pilot of the food uh, at schools and you see there they generate about 32, 232 gallons of food waste of food per lunch. 16 of that could be donated. Look at the lung, the milk intact. Could be donated and they're not donated. We have here some glean in San Diego. We have Nita here. Nita, say hi. Nita is from Crop Swap in San Diego, the glean. And they have done the harvest crop a lot. And last year alone, they did 25,000 pounds. And that was their goal for this year, a little bit over that. And in May, they already had reached 50,000. So it's picking up. It's being a wonderful thing. We have Kitchen for Goods in San Diego. It's a chef from Stone Brewery that creates a kitchen inside a food bank where they get imperfect food or food that the food bank cannot send it, turn into food. But they have a culinary cooking um, school there for underprivileged people. They just graduated 13 of them, and some of them are from released from jail or kids, uh, youth at risk, and he's training them. So they're not just giving them food, they're giving them a way out of poverty. And that's very important. That's what we want. And then we have the border. And I was trying to get food diversion from the border. That's the border of San Diego and Tijuana. If you haven't been there. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, would like, I would refer you to walk in or fly back, because this is the, the line coming back. But I found out it's a maze to find how I can get the food from the border. And the rat there happens to be me. <laughs> I'm trying to find the cheese and I can. It's been crazy. But I'll get there because in Arizona they're getting there. So I'll get there. So at, we, with all this effort, what we can see now from Feeding America alone, we have seen the increase in food donation from the good source. Uh, grocery stores, prepare food, catering. It's happened. The community is waking up and is helping more. And that's just Feeding America. For the food uh, mandate, we all know that quality of the nation, volume of the nation, and the reduction in greenhouse gases are the main things that we can take from the mandate. For that, we need to look at the biggest sources, gleaning, then food distributors, food processors, and grocery store, and schools. They have the kind of food that we want the most. Restaurants don't have as much. So for mandate for food donation, the pros are incredible increase awareness, bring community, decrease the gap between people. You have a chance to curb hunger, connect in business with the community, tax incentives, less greenhouse gases, new jobs, new business models. Fantastic. But I would like to alert about a few things. One of uh, not fair to all business. So we can't go to everybody. You can't say you have to donate food. Some business might not have that. Some business might not have 10% to donate. My disregard source reduction because they have to follow a mandate that they have to donate a certain amount. Might create excess purchase for that. Not enough infrastructure right now to capture all the donations. We all have been talking about this. What type of food is desired? We need to see that. And I am a chocoholic. I would love to have chocolate in my meals, but we need to make sure that they also have the other things. Impose extra costs for charities because you're going to see people dumping food waste with their wasted food. And the charity will have to dispose of that. And they create resentment. And we can lose perspective that we need to have food building soil. Otherwise, the whole system won't be sustainable. Thank you so much. So I think I can speak loudly enough. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Um, so, my name is Lorenzo Macaluso from the Center for Eco Technology, and we are an environmental nonprofit organization that is based here in Massachusetts. And we have about 80 or so professionals on staff that help businesses, communities, residents, uh, 
save energy and reduce waste. And we have been working in the wasted food space for about 25 years and constantly lately are sort of pitching ourselves that is this really happening, is this so exciting that this thing that we've been working on for so long is, is really uh, gained so much national, regional, state, and national notoriety. And to have uh, an event like this happening and be part of this great panel is really exciting for us. Um, and so uh, in putting this together, we were talking, Ona and I were talking a little bit about uh, the amount of work that we're doing in Massachusetts, but also sort of having a bit of a regional perspective. We're here in the Northeast. And uh, not only um, is there a disposal ban here in Massachusetts, but also in Vermont, in Connecticut, in Rhode Island, and also New York City. And so this is um, happening regionally here, I think sort of leading the country uh, from a, a sort of statewide perspective. Uh, but each of them do have some differences, and there are differences in infrastructure, there are differences in how it's um, put in place, and, and sort of the resources around that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, mostly here about the work that's happening right here in Massachusetts that uh, that we're working on with recy recycling works with, in partnership with MassDEP, uh, and that the, the the program itself has uh, now been around for over five years and does not just serve food. I think it's really important to note that uh, we look across material types and is focused on helping businesses and institutions across the Commonwealth um, reduce waste. Reuse whenever possible, donate, um, recycle, compost, anaerobic digestion, kind of all of the solutions are on the table to just throw less materials in the trash with an eye on the bottom line. This is a business and institutional uh, assistance program, so making everything cost effective and, um, and, and helping implement those programs at, at businesses. Uh, and, and Mass DEP has the policy side and, and has the enforcement capabilities and responsibilities for those for the disposal ban. Um, but I think that one of the really smart things that has happened here in setting up this program that, that uh, the Mass DEP uh, did right from the beginning is really decouple that regulatory side and uh, the enforcement side from the, from the technical assistance piece that's provided on the Recycling Works program. Uh, it really puts us in a position where, um, as a private nonprofit organization, uh, we can be trusted and, and really work closely with the business and, and, and truly and genuinely not have a regulatory responsibility uh, when, we're, when we're doing that assistance. And, and again, because we're not, a, we're not a hauler, we're not a processor, we're not, um, we're not a food rescue organization, uh, we're, but we're a facilitator and we're a connector of, of, all, of all of those options. So we don't have a horse in the race. We're not selling a particular solution. We are there to help make sure that, that good, valuable materials, no matter what they are, are not getting disposed of and helping them find that, that, um, that solution. And of course, when you're helping businesses, doing, being able to do that at no cost to them um, really helps quite a bit. <laughs> Uh, and so we've learned a lot of lessons in Massachusetts. We're really excited about our work and continue to do so. Uh, we've had a, a great opportunity uh, with some generous support from the from the Betsy and Jesse Pink Foundation to do some uh, so, sort of replicate some of the strategies that we found effective in Massachusetts. This is a map of uh, both generators and processing capacity in Connecticut. And so we're 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 doing some of the same kind of work in Connecticut. Um, and, and I'm happy to. Uh, be able to replicate and share some of those success stories and really talking regionally with, with how there can be more um, replication uh, of, of these strategies that we're using. So um, thinking about what we've seen and the, and the volume of work that we've done, uh, these are the things that at this point we think are like sort of the key factors from a policy perspective and then from this implementation side. Um, certainly having the policy in place uh, is really critical, um, helps kind of set the stage. Um, then uh, having the uh, enforcement of that policy is also really helpful and important. And, and I think something we're seeing um, certainly here in Massachusetts, but also regionally, is that enforcement doesn't always necessarily mean coming really hard with a hammer and coming out with fines, but um, knowing that there are, there are people paying attention and that um, the, the enforcement comes with help first, um, pointing that uh, generator to the help and the resources that are available to, to do a good job, to save money and to comply um, is a really, really effective enforcement strategy that we're seeing. And then of course having the infrastructure and the capacity, and, and we see infrastructure and capacity as all stages of the hierarchy. 
we're not just saying uh, what's the composting capacity, it's what is the food rescue capacity, um, how can we prevent waste from happening from happening in the first place, that helps increase capacity. Um, so looking at that at all stages of the hierarchy is really, I think, very critical and, and opens up the entire hierarchy. And then, of course, teaming all of that and, and having that education, technical assistance, um, training component so that, that the businesses that need to do this um, have all the tools that they need and, and can benefit from the experience and, and the help that we're able to provide through the Recycling Works program to be really effective in getting good, solid diversion programs, again, no matter where they are along the hierarchy. And so um, a little bit more uh, detail about how, uh, how the approach that, that we employ when we're working with businesses and, do, and giving that direct technical assistance uh, really ends up working is first of all meeting a business wherever they are. Um, this kind of ties back into that hierarchy discussion that, that we find that sometimes it may be so obvious that donation might be really the best suited thing or composting might be, but that might not be what the business sort of culture is or what their, their bandwidth is to take on at, uh, at a given moment. So we, again, being solution neutral, are able to say, well, here are a range of options. Here are a way, different strategies that you could employ. Where do you want to start? And by taking that approach, you can get to a yes very, more quickly and get something diverted. And we also find that that then opens up um, the rest of the hierarchy and that addressing one stage leads to another. Um, and I'm going to get into a little bit more of that in a second. Um, and then first, this is also not their core business. This is what we all care about a lot. And we're all here from all over the place to talk about it. But their business is selling groceries or uh, putting a great plate of food in front of their restaurant um, customer and having them come back again. That's what their core business is. And they need to stay focused on doing that and doing a great job at it. And our job is to make this as easy as possible so that they can stay focused on that and still have a cost effective and a great performing program. We also want to make sure we're engaging decision makers. Uh, we're very cognizant that this is um, a use of state resources and that it's not unlimited and that um, and so when we're going to spend that kind of resource and go out and help somebody that we have somebody who has the authority and the responsibility to actually make a decision about um, a change and operationally or um, contractually for, for these kind of services. Um, and, and that there's a lot of different service providers out there. We're always, encur we're always encouraging everybody to work with the current service provider first. Oftentimes just a few questions and showing some interest, whether it's on the composting side or any, anywhere else can get you the solutions that you're looking for. So we put all that together. We give all these different pros and cons. We provide lots of different potential solutions. And, and give them the information with those kind of pros and cons for them to make an informed business decision. And, and then it's up to them to, to take that step. We're not able to contract anything for them, but they're, they take that step. And then we can help them with the actual implementation of the training behind the house, um, the, the signage, the, all of those different pieces to really make that effective, whatever, whatever choice they make. The few are sort of the tools that we give them um, to do a good job. So, uh, I think to kind of really demonstrate this, it's helpful to, to go through a couple of examples. Um, so one here is UMass Amherst and Westfield State, two large state institutions, two state universities um, here. They end up doing the same thing, but in opposite orders. Um, um, if we've all heard of sort of the lean path system, is focused on waste prevention, and um, at UMass Amherst started with composting, realized, wow, there's so much food that's being wasted here for composting, that's great, but how can we do better? They implement the lean path system second. Um, and Westfield State really wanted to work on waste prevention first. They, they thought the lean path system was really helpful. Um, the beauty of it is that basically is providing for source separation, and then it was like, wow, it would be really easy to compost this. So they ended up getting to the same place, but in very different ways, and we kind of were able to listen to their culture and their approach to, to get them there. Um, I always love talking about Big Y Foods. They're a regional um, supermarket here in the Northeast. They have about 60 stores across Connecticut and Massachusetts. Um, they do a lot with also recycling and with help there. Um, but shrink control is a sort of a supermarket industry term that, about uh, food that's getting wasted and throwing away product that's getting thrown away. Um, they lock their dumpster, their, their compactor, and have clear plastic bags for all of their trash. And only the manager has the key, so the manager is able to see what's getting thrown away and can make some adjustments to the store to prevent from wasted food. 
Um, they, they do lots of donation, mostly using Rachel's Table, which is a food rescue organization um, out, of, out of the Springfield area. Um, and they do a lot with employee education. They have a, a program that we've helped them um, to inform them on that every employee has to log into a computer training system, and it has not just hand washing and bagging and all the other supermarket functions, but composting and recycling and, and how to do all of those things in their employee training program. And this is real money for them. Between the diver diversion, the, the not, not having to throw the stuff in the trash, and some of the revenue from the cardboard and film plastics that they're recycling, this is a $3 million boost to the bottom line and delivering over 16,000 tons of material from disposal. So this is the kind of numbers that um, make the corporation's eyeballs kind of open a little bit. Um, some other examples of kind of across the hierarchy, we work with a large um, a wholesaler for the grocery industry. And uh, this was another one where like, we thought that prevention would have been a good strategy, but they were really most motivated about composting. So we helped them get that composting program up and running. Once they were able to see how much source separated material and their own product that they were um, diverting and then paying another, uh, yes, less than disposal, but still paying for throwing that away, they then on their own, even without our help, were able to change ordering practices, changing fulfillment um, for their customers and, and storage practices, and reduce their, their um, generation of, of food waste in the first place, prevented a lot of that, and still composted what was left over. Uh, Cooley Dickinson Hospital is, is, a, is a hospital in, in our area that um, has been doing a great job with donation. Also, you happen to use Rachel's Table. They are making sure that anything that's behind the line, those, those full trays of lasagna and things like that that never get out there, they're wrapping them up quickly, getting them frozen, and, and they have a nice schedule um, to get those kinds of prepared foods donated. And uh, this is one where the composting side of things exceeded the expectations. Part of our technical assistance service always kind of put some estimates out there of what we think might happen, both on the cost side and the generation side, and that um, they've done such a great job of capturing as much as possible and really noticing that when people are in a hospital are sick and they don't eat as much as you know they may, and so there's a lot of opportunity for, uh, for composting. And, and um, uh, I wanted to finish with the Boston Public Market, which is uh, just a short ways away here, right in Boston, um, an awesome facility, and they're one that used the, the hotline, so this is an example of, not, it doesn't always take intensive on-site help, sometimes just a little bit of over the phone help can, can do what's needed, and they're doing both composting and um, donating food, and they're doing a really fantastic job, and hopefully, this is a really short video, and that will, Right. Yeah. Not a very short video. Or, you know what? We're just going to keep going. I know what it's. It's yeah. Sorry about that. It's, that video didn't work. So anyway, the, the 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 bottom line there is that they're doing a really amazing job of diverting um, a lot of food to composting, and they're also um, say producing enough food donation for about 19,000 meals um, every year uh, just out of the Boston Public Market. It's really high quality um, produce and other prepared foods. So as we are now in the, in the place where um, the food waste ban has been in effect for, for quite some time and we're, uh, this is kind of becoming more of a normal way of doing business, see here are some of the things that we're noticing and the um, trends we're seeing that even though there's been a tremendous amount of attention to the food waste ban here, um, education and awareness still is needed that, again, this is not their core business and still many people don't know that there um, is this obligation. Um, we continue to see lots of interest across industry sectors. It's not like any one particular in industry sector is sort of is all done. Um, we, we, we see requests across that. Um, and the continued interest across the hierarchy and to be more comprehensive in using many strategies as possible. And, and I think that one of the things that we're seeing um, really especially is that as composting especially becomes a sort of more um, normal way of doing business, the infrastructure continues to grow and smaller and smaller generators can plug in and participate um, cost effectively. So um, I, I uh, will wrap up there and that's sort of a look at what's happening here in the Northeast of our approach and the work that we've been doing in the recycling corner. So thank you. So we're going to open it up to questions.
questions. I did want to note that um, while I am moderating and not presenting, uh, our clinic has done um, a lot of work at the state and local level on things like states can have expiration date laws, they can have tax incentives for food donation, they can have extra liability protections. A lot of what you've heard about in some of the other panels at this conference, they can have policies around school food donation and institutional donation. So um, if those are things people want to discuss too, I think we can we can include that in the conversation. Um, I have some prepared questions, but in the interest of time, I want to make sure some other voices are heard. So um, do any people have some questions? And if not, I have plenty. Yes. yes I yeah. Oh, I, I'm so impressed with all the speakers and all that you're doing. Thank you so much. I was thinking, well, since you've got it all worked out, maybe could you just put together a curriculum for federal, state, and local government to sort of follow Is there a way to to collectively pull together uh, the, the information and experiences, like it's going to be at best management practices and whatnot, into one sort of portal or, or some sort of training curriculum so that we're not all reinventing the wheel and we can share readily? There's a tool. Yeah. So, funny, you should mention that. Um, there's a paper that the West Coast Climate and Materials Management Forum, it's a partnership program between EPA's Region 9 and 10, and it's a policy paper I've been working on for over a year. Um, back in May, we interviewed about 10 different state and local governments around the U.S. who were seen as having kind of premier programs on tackling the hierarchy really holistically. And I think the Massachusetts and Connecticut example is really unique because they have the technical assistance body through CET that's not happening in other states that have landfill bans. So we actually analyzed all the different policy approaches and tools and looked at, well, how well are those lining up with actual environmental outcomes? If what you care about is water conservation and greenhouse gas emissions, well, are your approaches really aligning in the ways you think they are and really kind of chewed through some of those unquestioned assumptions that we've really all sort of been blindly following because everyone else is doing it. Um, so that paper is meant to be kind of thought-provoking and just show how depending on where you're interested you can see the pros and cons of different tools and objectives um, and build upon what's working and maybe fill the research gaps where we know we can do better. Are those in the Region 9, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but uh, Region 9 is a transforming waste tool, um, and it has uh, organic very uh, prominently, and it has actual organisms from being organized across the country. And so it's sort of meant in some way to be this type of resource. You can just click in whatever it is that you're interested in and out spits out all these different things you can use around the country. So I'm not sure there's a lot around donation and diversion, so this actually looks at how those policies connect with doing upstream work around prevention. So it's an analysis from the upper levels of the hierarchy, essentially. That should be out in August, mid-August. And I will add to that um, that Ashley and I have been talking because our clinic is uh, publishing later this year a toolkit on state and local food recovery policy. Um, so that will be, I think, less um, maybe analysis than Ashley's um, report in that we're not going to um, necessarily um, bash any, well, not that your report bashes anyone. It doesn't bash anyone, yeah. But, but just giving all the options point. that we've seen so far, <laughs> some best practices at the state and local level, and it'll cover the kind of the list I just uh, went through. So date labels, tax incentives, liability protections, school food donation, government appropriation. So there'll be different chapters. Uh, I would love to say it'll be done by the end of August, but let's say end of the year. <laughs> and that will yeah. be readily available to, to oh yeah it'll be posted online um, check out our website and our Facebook page we always post but it I was thinking you know if you could take collectively take all that information and just sort of bring it on the road to a municipality across the country or a state across the country that's great. <coughs> I think that's one of the things that's missing is like all these state and local government officials are so you know everybody's just after trying to juggle so much and to have the training to do is um there's a project that NRDC is developing, so Dana Gunders is here and Joanne's here. Do you want to mention the cities project? Yeah, yeah. we're, um, the NRDC has increasingly been working in cities, focusing first in Nashville, Tennessee, Denver, and New York City. But as a complement to that work in those places, we're also putting together a toolkit or policies and programs that municipalities can work on relative to food waste. So we're in the early stages of that, or probably a year from now we'll have that that's worked out. And we also welcome case studies and suggestions for what to include. Yeah, same with the white paper. And anyone who's interested in reviewing it, let me know. And I just want to say we're not bashing anyone. No, no, I it's <laughs> input from the people we interviewed because we're like, wow, how do you do it? And they're like, oh my god, it's so hard. You know, nothing about what we thought would help us do this work actually is. So it's just meant to be a I transparent conversation. In, the, in a comparison. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> yes. Um, I realize that this is this panel is more about kind of um, upstream you know, waste reduction, um, but I think even more in that this is state and local policy and state and local policy makers in the room. Um, at, at the downstream end, of people actually accessing their recovery foods and, and people who, even in a city like Boston, uh, where I work, uh, transportation limitation is huge. Um, and so I'm wondering from the you know, state level, local level, policy level, how much is there um, engagement across departments so that DEP is actually talking to Department of Transportation about, okay, let's reduce obviously waste reduction, but then how are we getting that food to people? Um, you know, again, even in Boston, people are challenged to get to the food pantries, to get to farmers markets, to get to grocery stores um, because of transportation limitations. So we're tackling it at a very micro local level because the state is 10 years behind. So anything, <coughs> anything on that? Uh, I think that well, one thing that I can say that I think is a little, t a little close to what you're saying is that uh, one of the things that, that we try to do through this program is really understand um, the range of possible distribution <coughs> systems and all of the different um, rescue networks that are that are out there, so that when we um, when we get inquiries and we're finding um, available donatable food, that we're able to point those folks in the right direction, so that we're continuing to feed that pipeline. And there are really good. Um, uh, especially in the in the Boston area, there are good distribution centers. Uh, not, I'm sure there could be improvements, and there could be even more. Um, but but from the from that perspective of, of making more material available and making it as plugged into the right outlets as possible, that's a, at least I'm hoping it's 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 helping address that to some degree at least. And I can share some research questions that we came up with in Oregon. So one thing we were thinking about is, you know, I think when we look forward, we often tend to look behind us. What's been done and how do we iterate on it and improve it? Well, with rescue, we're like, well, d does it really make the most sense to be feeding people with rescued food? You know, is there a way to maybe partner with some sort of business and really focus on zero shrink? And then with the funding and the money that they save, maybe invest in hiring more employees and then some fraction of that gets invested in like a farm to food bank program where you're guaranteed to get an organ crop tax credit, which is pretty unique in Oregon, which incentivizes the donation of healthier food. And it's a real direct route versus, you know, biking around half trays of lasagna, which sometimes is your only option, but is that really what's gonna make the most sense? And um, just one thing is in San Diego, there are some municipalities in the region looking at the franchise agreement with the haulers. Uh, there is no infrastructure for transportation. Would the haulers now see that as their role and they change their trucks to refrigerated trucks and they will be transporting that food to the one that's needed because the municipalities now have to comply with it. So that's <coughs> one thing that we're looking. Still see that as a waste diversion, not as resource, but you still find the transportation for the donation. And just a comment, uh, Ashley, I was very interested in your talk and in this, this evolution of how to think about food, waste of food, surplus food. Um, I've got reached the point now where when I look at the hierarchy, I don't even think food waste kicks in until it drops below feeding needy people. So in my, my mind, instead of food is raised to feed people, as long as it's feeding people, the waste term is not appropriate. We aren't there yet. And a lot of the questions that are coming up here right now it's important for me to always remember that we aren't even close to the solutions yet. I mean, this is still our thinking about archaic systems and trying to help them grow. So um, one thing that I'd like to picture, and I know it's just words, but from the standpoint of source reduction and feeding needy people in a community where all of this happens, this doesn't happen, nothing doesn't happen here, it happens in a community, that it becomes a very seamless process, a very normal way of doing business. And aligned with that, sustainability includes social, environmental and economic issues, and there's really more of those are the three fundamental pillars. You can't zero in on one to the exclusion of the other two and pretend it's sustainable. Really, you have to try to capture all of those components. And what that's helping me to see and to try to drive towards is trying to leverage the power of the economic system that we have in this country to make a big difference. For example, feeding people in need. 
why do people who need food have to go to some food bank or food shelter or pantry in a church basement and be embarrassed? And say, this is absurd. So really a long way from solving problems about the, you know, getting food to the right people. We're working with the grocery store sector right now that's going to be experimenting. You know they have all these delivery services? Uber, Lyft, oh, there's all sorts of them. Supermarkets delivering food, online calls. We're working with an organization that's thinking about taking their perishables themselves on their routes to currently the shelters that can receive them. So th these are little adjustments and tweaks to models, but they can have very significant outcomes as they grow and mature. I think what's interesting about the last two comments is it kind of raises the, the importance, not just in the food recovery policy space, but in all food policy space of um, working um, with communities and working with stakeholders rather than the, uh, kind of seeing it as a service provided to people. How can we work with each other? And especially with food waste, there is this cultural shift both in um, people that are um, that are wasting the food, uh, you know, talking to them about changing culture, I think, as Anna talked about a lot, and then also this, um, for, for the eaters, and that's people that are buying food, that's people that are getting food for free, you know, talking about um, what they see as the solutions as well. So I wonder if the panelists can talk a little bit about how they, um, in the initiative they've worked on, how they've interacted with community members and um, what that process has looked like um, in either policy development or in policy implementation. Yeah, so the Oregon 2050 vision I mentioned, you know, wasn't designed for Oregonians, it was designed with Oregonians. And it's really not DEQ's vision, it's Oregon's vision. So that took two years to come up with that vision. And like Tom mentioned, kind of this evolution in thinking and the conversation, I mean, I know Oregon's in a unique place. That's why I'm there for two years. So if anyone wants to partner around these proof of concept projects, as I'm calling them, you know, the more the merrier. But it really comes down to, and we saw it with the design of the Food to Good to Waste Toolkit at EPA, like think about it if someone came to you and said hey I, I designed this for you it's really going to be good for you I think you need it how would that feel versus let's design it together you know it's, it's just a totally different frame and I think you get really different outcomes when you approach it in that way um, Bill Beamer at City of Portland who shared that slide with me I mean it was brilliant I was on this panel with him and some other local community members um, three weeks ago and I had officially worked myself out of a job so I challenge all of you to really look at this systemic problem from that perspective. And when we think about recovery and recovery policy from the donation, and in Oregon, recovery means recycling, so it's confusing. Um, but when we think about recovery, also, I challenge you to think about whether it's because it makes you feel good or because it really works for who you're trying to serve. I'll add to that that, um, that one of the things, it was in a previous session here, we, we talked about best management practices around, around food donation that you know, was great enough to, to help us with. Um, and, and that I, I really agree that the stakeholder buy-in and engagement is really critical that, that um, in that process we had food rescue organizations, um, that the public health sector, and donors all at the table at the same time in a really organized way across the entire state, building consensus, Getting everybody um, to, to contribute and and have and be bought into the process, and and then it wasn't um, it wasn't a toolkit or a or or a document that that we're just putting out there. It was something that everybody kind of contributed to, and it has sort of a life of its own, and and it, it's really taken off and has it's it's getting a lot of views on the website, and it's 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 something that's really uh, it's become part of of the community uh, looking at food donation and um, and I really think it's because of that process and that involvement and that buy-in that happened um, through that through that process that's, that was unique um, in that way. Okay, so um, uh, we at BioCycle Conference in San Diego this year, Angel Arroyo from Ohio EPA, was saying that they create a donation that would come and bring the food to a community and they will bring it to a certain area for the community to get and they were not coming to get it. And he didn't know what's going on and then they found out they didn't have the pots and pens. So it's something like we are thinking that we are helping and we are not knowing what they really needed. So when they realized they got pots and pens and <laughs> donated with the food so they could cook. So it's something that a lot of times we think we're doing the best and we're trying to help those people and we're not because we don't understand what's the real problem. That's the importance of engaging. And I went to visit City Soil yesterday 
and they have a greenhouse that they are planting food from different communities, uh, migrants' communities around here that they don't get their food here. So they find out what they are, they found the seeds, they found the proper soil that they can grow so that community can have the food that has meaning to them. So those are some examples of how we can involve. And in San Diego, the San Diego Food Bank, we had, uh, I'm sorry, the San Diego Food System Alliance had a seminar recently that they were talking about, we have a bunch of white, well-educated persons talking about that. And you go to a community where you have mixed race and they look at you like, you don't know who I'm doing with. So how we can change that? And another data is that the most of the vacant lots in San Diego that we can build community gardens are in low-income communities. So how do we get somebody from that community to champ that? And they'll grow the food that makes sense for them. And not me, Anna from the city, or just Anna, a citizen that say, hey, you need healthy food. <coughs> Shut up, lady, right? <laughs> so that's what we're trying to do, too. You have a very good point. And one model, just to build off Anna's point, is community-based social marketing, or just social marketing. Um, there's an international group that supports it. Um, I'm a board member of the Pacific Northwest Social Marketing Association, and that's the frame for building those kinds of community champions. So there's lots of resources out there to build upon that. So um, I want to um, ask you all to join me in thanking our panelists. Uh, and I know there were a lot of other hands. Maybe our panelists will stick around for a few minutes to answer questions, but I want to respect your afternoon coffee and snack break. So, <laughs> enjoy. Great job, guys. Oh, that was fun. I